Myths are not stories that are untrue. Rather, they are tales that don't fit neatly into the historical record, which serve as a foundation to a culture. You know, it was super fun getting a tour of Hades with Zagreus, and it was wild watching the Furies embrace their gentler side. But I am pooped. I don't know if I can handle another escape attempt right now. So instead, I'd like to talk about one more character from the game who I feel gets misrepresented a lot in pop culture. Plus, I have all these bottles of nectar saved up, so, uh, hey, Dusa, you still around? I think it's high time we told your story, don't you? Thanks so much to Ting Mobile for helping us share today's mythology with you as clearly as possible. While the maid Dusa in Hades is pretty timid and adorable, the ancient Greek Medusa is very different. She was born long ago from two divine parents, Forces, a minor god of the sea who had a fish tail, lobster claws, and shiny chitinous red skin, and Seto, water goddess and mother of sea monsters. Now Seto and Forces had a bunch of children, monstrous dragons, great sailor snatching crabs, mighty sea serpents, as well as the one-eyed Gria. You'll remember them from our Perseus series. And of course, their three sisters, the Gorgons, Steno, Euryale, and Medusa. Now, Steno and Euryale were immortal like their parents, but Medusa was born mortal. Plus, unlike the rest of her fishy family, she was born beautiful by human standards, with striking features and long flowing hair. Because of this, Medusa decided to live among the mortals in Athens as a priestess of Athena. And not to put too fine a point on it, she lived a pretty rock star life because Athena was the patron goddess of the city, so her priestesses served as role models and celebrities, with Medusa the most popular of them all. Everyone wanted to be friends with her, and a little more than a few wanted to be more than that. But unfortunately, that kind of attention wasn't of just the mortal variety. One day, as Poseidon was cruising along the wine dark sea, out of the corner of his eye, he spotted Medusa. Then she noticed him. And time froze, sparks flew, the whole nine yards. They were crazy for each other at first sight. And so later that evening, they met each other in Athena's temple for a lover's tryst. Though in hindsight, maybe they should have picked a slightly more private venue because before long, Athena strolled in and caught them in the act. Athena was shocked, just shocked, disrespected by her own priestess, in her own temple nonetheless. And not just by anyone, mind you, but her best and brightest. Did Medusa's vows mean nothing? Plus, Poseidon was her uncle, and also a god, so he knew how important priests and priestesses were. He should have known better, too. But Medusa could only shrug. I mean, what could she say? Poseidon was a god, and what they had was real. They were in love, and they would be together for all of— And he's gone. Real classy, Poseidon. And with Poseidon bailing back to the ocean because he knew the vibes were, you know, getting heavy, Medusa was left to her fate alone. And to answer for the vows broken, Athena transformed Medusa into a monster just like her sisters. Her skin began to change to a deep reptilian green. Her flowing hair morphed into a writhing, hissing nest of fearsome snakes. And finally, Athena bestowed Medusa with a powerful divine visage that turned anyone who looked upon her into stone. Now some say this was meant to be a curse, a punishment doled out by a jealous Athena because Medusa broke her vow while others say this might have been meant as a gift, that Athena elevated the mortal Medusa to divine form and freed her from her confines of being a priestess, allowing her to do as she wished. But regardless of reason, one thing was for sure. Medusa didn't want to stay in Athens anymore. I mean, how could she? Nobody would even recognize her. Ugh, and if they did, she didn't want to risk turning any of her friends or fans into stone. Not that she'd probably have any looking the way she did. <laughs> And so, she decided to leave Athens and move to an island far across the ocean to be closer to her sea monster family and take some time to recover. And unfortunately, we all know how Medusa's story ends. While she was resting back home, chilling with her family, and minding her own business, I might add, some Perseus fella that she's never even heard of busts in and kills her in her sleep. Oh, and then offers her decapitated head as a gift to Athena as a way to prove his worthiness. Holy mackerel, Tusa, that is just horrifying. He really just murdered you in your sleep. And then Athena wore your head on her shield like a trophy? That's just cold. I don't even, I don't even know. No wonder you preferred the underworld to Olympus. Some of them can be huge jerks sometimes. 
But in all relative seriousness, one of the things I love the most about these myths, and especially about exploring them through video games, is that they help us build relationships with these characters and understand their challenges and choices more deeply. For instance, how many people, not super well versed in Greek mythology, and who only had a passing knowledge of Medusa, only saw her as a frightening evil monster before they played Hades? I'm betting quite a few. Plus, there's a lot to be learned from Medusa's story. First and foremost being that it might be nice if the gods could just leave mortal women alone sometimes, but also that it's okay to go home and spend time with your family if you're having difficulties. Even if that family is a bunch of snake-haired ladies, a lobster fish guy, and a terrifying goddess of the deep. But what might be the most important lesson in this myth is that not everything that looks scary is bad, and not everything that looks beautiful is good. Unless you're Zoe, of course, in which case you're scary, beautiful, bad, and good all rolled into one. I really lucked out there. Oh, oh, and speaking of Medusa, do you know why you can never hear her over the phone? Huh? Because there's always a hiss on the line. That is, of course, until she tried the new and improved Ting Mobile. Now, I don't have to tell you how expensive cell phone bills can be. In fact, a few months ago, I looked at mine and realized if Zoe's treat budget was to be maintained, I needed to find a solution. Then Ting came to the rescue, and I cut my phone bill in half. And I'm not the only one. Our studio director, Jeff, has been keeping a tally of all of the money he's saved by switching to Ting for his family's two phones and an iPad. Where are we at, Jeff? Whoa, that is a lot of treats. And that savings is because you can choose the plan that's right for you. With their Flex plan, you get unlimited talk and text for just $10 a month. Then only pay $5 a gig for data when you use it, which is great because Wi-Fi is everywhere these days. They also have their Set 5 plan for $25 a month, which includes 5 gigs up front for if you know you're going to be on the move. And for you hardy travelers, there's the unlimited talk, text, and data plan for just 45 bucks a month. So you can keep up with all of your content on the go. Plus, switching is super easy. Just head to extracredits.ting.com to check your phone's compatibility, then create an account and pick a plan that's right for you. Oh, and when you bring your phone and use our link, you also get a $25 service credit to try Ting with no strings attached. They'll send you a SIM card you pop in your phone, and you'll be saving some cash, helping support our channel, and be up and running in no time. A huge thanks to our legendary patrons, O'Reels1, Kyle Murgatroyd, Joseph Blaine, Dominic Valenciana, Casey Muscha, Alicia Bramble, and Ahmed Ziad Turk. 